also mute myself while you speak. We're, we're live. Uh, Adab, uh, welcome again to those of you who have been following our series uh, in Islam after colonialism, uh, co-sponsored by uh, the University of Exeter and Habib University. Uh, my name is uh, Noman Nakri. I teach, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Comparative Liberal Studies uh, over here. I'll just start by saying something about the title of the series for those of you who uh, are coming here for the first time. Islam after colonialism uh, necessarily assumes uh, that there was a great transformation uh, that uh, took place under colonialism and not just colonialism, uh, that transformation continued in the post-colonial uh, period or the period after formal decolonization. Um, and yes, indeed, there was such an extraordinary transformation as uh, lots of uh, scholarship over the past several decades uh, has illuminated. Um, Islam after colonialism uh, not only uh, discusses uh, that transformation, uh, but uh, also gives us glimpses of what there was in the past, what uh, there's a necessary gesture uh, to the before, uh, when you say after. Uh, so uh, we've had some of those, and today I think uh, we'll combine both of these elements as well as the other uh, part of this, uh, which is gesturing towards something uh, as the post in post-colonial, for instance, also gestures towards the possible future. Uh, that uh, and I hope uh, that in fact uh, we will have at some point uh, decolonized a task that is really uh, before us. So uh, with that brief introduction, uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Sajjad Rizvi uh, from the University of Exeter uh, will introduce our eminent speaker for today. Sajjad. Thank you, Norman. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ibrahim Musa, who is the uh, Mirza Family Professor of Islamic Thought and Muslim Societies at the University of Notre Dame. Um, a number of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with, with Ibrahim's work. Um, I think I first came across his work um, when I read his uh, book on Ghazali, and actually I reviewed it about 15 years ago, I think it was, or something like that. Um, and in many ways, that book already kind of signals some of the things which I suspect we will talk about, um, which is you know, how do we make sense of this particular heritage, this kind of liminal heritage of, of Islamic thought in the past? What utility does it have uh, for people, for current uh, contemporary Muslims thinking about these sorts of issues? And how do we uh, bring that intellectual heritage in conversation with the different kinds of um, theoretical and intellectual challenges and um, um, ideas that uh, we face? Um, from philosophy, from other um, fields in the humanities. And then of course, uh, that work also developed with uh, his more recent work, which is uh, called What is a Madrasa? Um, which is, is partly um, a, a historical uh, stroke normative study of this particular notion of, a, of an educational institution and its significance in, in the world of Islam. But, in a sense, it also signals the question of what it might be. Um, and increasingly, I think a lot of us uh, who are engaged in Islamic thought are also concerned with how it is that some of these institute, institutions and perhaps informal institutions, how do they develop and move forward? You know, what, what might the seminary, the madrasa, uh, 20, 30, 50, 100 years from now, what, what might it actually look like? Um, what sort of priority should it have? How should it be training people? Uh, um, what is the nature of that training and so forth? And, and what, of course, what significant social uh, and political um, uh, role do those institutions have in, in, in our futures as well? So um, we can say a lot more about Ibrahim's work. I've known him for a number of years, a wonderfully interesting um, interlocutor and, and friend, uh, and someone who, um, I, I, one last thing I will say is that you know, we're interested also in doing this series because we want to take thought out there. You know, the fact of the matter is we're doing this on Facebook. This is not just an, a, a very limited set of seminars for a limited academic audience. Uh, we hope that actually there are people who are not academics who are also interested in these questions. So we, we really want to take 
thought and praxis out into the world, out into societies. And we very much um, in, uh, invite that engagement and response and feedback from um, all of those who, who might be watching this um, out there. So uh, I think that's probably enough for me to say. Um, for that, this is uh, in that context, I think Ibrahim is a wonderful person to be presenting it. And hopefully we will also be talking about some of uh, the actual projects he's been working on, which are about connecting, um, connecting dots, connecting different people's uh, thought worlds, uh, ideas and practices uh, that are of relevance um, to this world of Islam after colonialism. So um, without any more from me, uh, please, uh, Professor Ibrahim Musa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Rizvi and Professor Rizvi and Professor uh, Noman Nakvi. Uh, thank you for this invitation. It's great to meet um, uh, Professor Nagvi in uh, in virtually, and um, Sajada. We, we we saw each other a couple of years ago in London. Uh, although we've been in in contact in in a variety of ways, so thank you. Uh, it's great to be part of the Exeter community and network that you have, and. Um, so you know the the uh, when you force me to nah, I'm only kidding you didn't force me but when you invited me so generously and say you know do something um, that you that you have been thinking about and work that you're relevant don't do anything new I thought that you know I I'll give the the pretext for uh, this appearance as you know contestations of uh, between kind of post-colonial um, uh, in the in the post-colony rather uh, in this question of um, contestations, contestations, contestations in knowledge traditions among different Muslim groups on the subcontinent. Um, so obviously there's also this whole question of the post-colony and this whole question that is now trying to push the post-colony to ask different kinds of questions um, is the question of decolonial, which is also part of some of the kind, kind of the threads of your, of your series. So let me let me start by saying, you know, how do I get here? How do I get to Ghazali and how do I get to the Madrasa? Right. Um, because in in many ways, I find my uh, meditations and thinking on Islamic thought largely biographical, if not autobiographical. Uh, and all history uh, is in some ways related to the question of the self and who you are and what you are and where you are going to go. You know, and what is the good life you know how does one live the good life and so it starts from a very early age growing up in apartheid south africa where i'm not entirely sure who am i i'm you know born in a a muslim uh, gujarati family they are traders there's no idea of aspiration of going to universities and so on uh, although my generation begin to think yes there's something that you know if you don't want to go into into family business you have to do something with yourself and i come across as a put in the in the book, What is a Madrasa? I come across a colleague at the school, uh, at high school, asking me questions about Islam and the Prophet Muhammad and making all kinds of allegations and uh, about is Islam being a false religion, the Prophet Muhammad being a false prophet. And these questions start me, start, you know, make me start thinking about these kind of questions, you know, who am I, what am I? Is this faith that I'm holding on to be true? And the quick way to cut a long story short is there's the local Tablis Jamaat who is at the mosque that I do attend, but I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing at the mosque. They give me some kind of emotional solace, but it doesn't answer the intellectual questions about, you know, how does one have a law that was developed in the seventh century where they amputate hands and uh, people who are engaged in certain kind of moral and other kinds of offenses, they have their you know, um, necks uh, cut off or beheaded, or they get punished by death. Now, I grew up in a country in South Africa where death was all around me. Black people are being killed all the time by apartheid police. Uh, they did have the death penalty, so people would be killed all the time. But this idea that a faith tradition also advocates something that, to my very juvenile sensibilities, sounded fairly harsh, okay? And I didn't have much knowledge. Uh, about Islam. That set me off and say, I need to go and study Islam uh, at a place where I can answer, with, with a place where these nagging questions can be answered. And through the Tabligh movement, I realized that India is a destination. Actually, it was originally meant to be Pakistan is the destination 
to go and study at the madrasa, why didn't I go to the Arab world, many people would say, is because in the city of Cape Town, where I grew up in, there were a number of Arab uh, uh, trained ulama, but you know, in the tabligh movement saw them as being less devoted. Uh, they wore Western clothes, they had their beards trimmed as mine, um, and, and they were not, you know, complying to the kind of the, the, the various paraphernalia and the kind of devout formation as the Tablij Jamaat advocated. Today, I will have to eat my words when I say that, what I used to say uh, more than four decades ago, but that was the impressionistic idea I had that South Asia has authenticity. So authenticity is the attraction of the madrasa. But that was a very juvenile understanding of authenticity insofar as that I thought of authenticity as exterior things, right? It's about, it's about the beard and clothing and a devotion to Islam also was part of authenticity. But what is authenticity is still a question I'm trying to figure out. Um, so um, when I get to South Asia, obviously my eyes open up. Uh, India, uh, the Pakistan thing doesn't work out. Some of my friends go to Pakistan. I end up in India. I begin experimenting with different madrasas. I go from a regional madrasa in Gujarat to Dioban and uh, both of those places do not really quench my intellectual thirst. I finally end up at Nadwatul Ulama in Lucknow, uh, where the famous uh, scholar Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi uh, used to be the um, uh, the head of the institution, uh, uh, the the uh, equivalent of say the the vice chancellor or the or the principal of the institution. Uh, and so, going to a big city such as Lucknow from the small kind of Kasba, a small town of Dioban, uh, exposed me to a range of uh, possibilities. Uh, there was like, next door to me was Lucknow University. Uh, I'm now in a big city. I frequent the British Library. I'm now reading. You, you, you must remember, I left South Africa at age 17 and a half, 18. Uh, I didn't go to college. This is my first exposure. So after one or two years learning Arab, foundational Arabic and Urdu, um now i'm beginning to grapple with the with the madrasa tradition and um obviously when i leave india um uh, after six years there i go into journalism i go to london work for arabia magazine my basic idea was you know this is a good experience but i don't think what well, everything i studied doesn't hang together doesn't really make sense doesn't really make sense. And I'm not sure what it is, but you know, I fought with my entire family uh, to leave South Africa and not go to university. I managed my aunts, uh, persuaded my father to let me go. I finished the curriculum there. I'm now kind of labeled an alim, but I'm not sure what this is all about. In London, I frequent the, the School of Oriental African Studies Library because it was near where I was working. And I come across an author by the name of Fazlur Rahman that I never heard of. And I read Islam. When I read Islam, the book, I said, wow, this man knows everything I was taught, but he can put it into a framework. Now slowly the big picture comes forward. The big picture appears that what I didn't get in a madrasa, the madrasa doesn't pay attention to history, doesn't give you the big picture. You learn all about Imam Abu Hanifa, about Shafi, uh, you learn about Al Ashari, you learn about small, it's a very, as Fazl Rahman is right, it's presented to you in an atomistic way. But the kind of big picture doesn't come together. Fast forward, I leave the UK, go to South Africa, and when I go to South Africa, I'm thrown deep into an anti apartheid struggle, and Muslims are trying to think about the questions of justice and freedom and majority rule. And we, myself, people like Farid Isaac and others, we are now up against the ulama who are saying that these people are, the majority are non-Muslims. Muslims must preserve themselves. There are all kinds of fatwa for Muslim self-preservation, but how to deal with the democratic uh, South African question uh, is something that I wrote about when I was in London. I, I laid out the landscape in Arabia magazine, the landscape for Muslims and the challenges that they had uh, in South Africa. And therefore, a number of people, when I got back to South Africa, they started inviting me, you need to talk about the national liberation question. So is now the national liberation question, this background that I have brings me back to my text of the madrasa. Now I'm not only reading, you know, Maududi and Said Qutb, but I'm now going back 
to tafsir, to ilm al-kalam, to those things that I thought did not have great value. Now I'm returning to the madrasa, but now dressed differently, but also intellectually equipped differently. And this continues to my going to University of Cape Town, doing a master's and PhD degree in the religious studies. And that raises a number of questions. So what is it that, 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 I, that I struggle with? So when I, you know, 9-11 happens, the madrasas become, uh, you know, long story short, I had moved to the United States in 1998 uh, at Duke uh, and uh, uh, first Stanford for three years as a visiting professor, then Duke for about 13 years. And in 2014, I moved to University of Notre Dame. So the madrasas are kind of blackballed in the United States as the, these, uh, you know, the, the people, the occupants of it are, are the denizens of, of terrorism. Uh, and, and, and also these are terrorist, uh, you know, kind of warehouses. And basically I wanted to write a book to explain to the world what the madrasa, madrasas are all about. The question that I go with to research is in India and Pakistan and go back to walk back in the footsteps that I walked many decades ago is what I discovered is that the knowledge tradition that the madrasas provide are great, it links me to my heritage, but that heritage does not in many ways deal with the modern state, doesn't deal with a self, they call it a modern self. Look, let's use the word modern as a placeholder. What is the modern is sometimes overdone, but it's a, a different world. It's a different world. We're in a stage of post empire, but imperial epistemologies are still flourishing and they are through Western education, other modes of modes of existence. And those modes of existence of the colonial heritage in variety of ways dominate and shape the societies in which Muslims find themselves. They are faced with questions of human rights. In South Africa, we are faced with the questions of national liberation. We have questions about gender rights and how do we deal with that? Uh, how do we deal with questions of citizenship as, as, as a Muslim minority? In a, in a country like South Africa. And the, and the answers that Muslims are, are finding are all contained within a tradition, sure, but that tradition doesn't fully speak to the lived reality of Muslims. So, so, my, so my big kind of you know, existential question is that how do, I, how do I live my tradition and my, my temporality? It's about tradition and temporality. It's about tradition, which in many ways is also organized by time in some ways, but is also, you know, timeless in many aspects. But there's also the question of time and temporality. And time and temporality was that juvenile question of mine about laws and rules and regulations and practices that are connected to certain and different sociological and anthropological spaces and what is the place what is the place of those kinds of practices in a world in which is now organized differently so this question of epistemology runs through the ghazali book where i'm very very you know uh, quietly and also respectfully trying to raise some questions in conversation with ghazali um, about the questions about the self about epistemology about you know what is what 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 are the allowable questions and what are the not allowable questions? Ghazali's fight with the philosophers, he's um, you know penalizing people like Ibn Sina and others on three issues um, that has a life of its own. But when I went go to this uh, to the subcontinent in two thousand and four and two thousand and five to research the madrasa book, my question to my teachers and my question to madrasa audiences are, and I while the book is mostly on kind of the Dioban school and some Brelvi, I also talk to Salafis, I also talk to Shia institutions and so on. My question to them was, you know, the question of knowledge. How do you deal with knowledge of the present in your conversation with tradition? And I, I swear, most of these people thought I'm asked as a question that they didn't understand or they answered in that way, the following way. Well, we don't stop people from learning other knowledge. We don't stop. We don't, we don't tell people, but I know they discourage people from going to universities. Uh, when anyone wants to leave Dioban or Nadwa or Barelvi and want to go and study at Aligarh University, the teachers would say, oh, 
you are getting off a you you are getting off a horse and mounting a donkey is it you know i mean in other words you and the big fear is that the that these modern ed, ed, institutions uh, with modern ed, are contaminating or uh, uh, contaminate uh, the muslim self the self that the madrasas try to try to nurture so the madrasas are places of nurturing of a self going to a certain kind of formation but i think it's all now in my view given my experience and my recent inquiries that what the madrasas historically might have been a republic of letters it had become a republic of piety it's all about the cultivation of piety but the cultivation of piety according to a playbook that doesn't always take the knowledge of the present into into consideration in other words do you need manuals now that is going to deal with the self in a kind of a post you know post einsteinian world a a a question about a world where you know in the world post ghazalian ibn taymiyyah mulla sadra universe where a variety of realities that are, that are shaping us organize and also work on our souls we are just not entirely connected to this past so when i raise this question of knowledge most of them you know give this kind of answer it seems that they don't really understand or the other answer would be we don't have the qualifications to teach math and science and my question was no i'm not asking you to teach math and science you might want to get a math and science teacher in there to give you some of the elementary understandings of of math and science but what i'm talking about uh, i'm talking about uh, what we call the humanities uh, in talking about deeper understandings of arabic literature persian literature deeper understandings and more complex understandings of of philosophy philosophy is completely neglected in the madrasas people learn these books five page only study five pages of the book and then close it down and learn certain mustalahat because that language in itself has is is no longer understandable and the study and the teaching of arabic in the madrasas are absolutely horrific i mean students get through a 6 year 8 year 9 year curriculum by looking at urdu commentaries uh, and 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 a, and and a senior teacher at at nadwa and nadwa which is renowned for the study of arabic uh, and prides itself even a professor there told me that you know only 1 or 2% of the top most understand arabic language well okay now you're going to find some very very brilliant uh, graduates there those are the graduates that i have uh, some of them that i've pulled into my madrasa discourses project who know uh, uh, these texts uh, fairly well um and and i uh, i will i will pivot to that in, in a minute so this question of you know what it what is knowledge and how does one you know i don't like the word um, reconcile because it's not about question of conciliation but it's it's a question of of you know in the ways in which now you know people might be critical of the early muslim philosophers that they they instrumentalized the greek legacy Instru- because the word instrumentalization today is a ugly word right uh, even if it's you know it's even if it's a um, what what gyatri spivak would call a strategic instrumentalization you know or a, a strategic way that you do that but you're critical that they they really don't you know there's no organic way so i think i'm what i'm searching for is an organic way that the the muslim soul and the muslim self um would begin to understand um the complexity of human reality and how do we navigate that complexity is the kind of primary question that i ask in in um um uh in 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 this book and you know i cite somewhere michel foucault's claim that the the desire to know is in his nature already something like knowledge something belonging to knowledge so this desire that we have is already there uh and 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 what it is that how to create this framework the big challenge that i found the big challenge that i found is that with especially with learning that will deal with the foundation sources of our tradition the interpretation and the hermeneutics of the quran and the sunna uh, the conversations regarding um ilmul kalam uh, theology usul al fiqh legal theory fiqh in itself that knowledge coming from the outside would be seen as hugely disruptive 
at least for the people in the madrasa sphere, they would say that that knowledge was not produced within a Muslim soul, it's outside the knowledge, right? And so even citing Foucault might not be, what might not serve as hujja, as proper evidence, especially when people come to know what, what Foucault's biography is about, right? Uh, and then suddenly, why are you now, you know, quoting a, a man who was openly gay uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Foucault's, you know, we cannot be trusted because the trust in knowledge has to do with a certain kind of righteousness and a certain kind of conformity to tradition. And the lack of that um, would result in the discrediting of authority or articulation or um, uh, presenting <clears throat> that, that insight as a valuable insight of Hekma. Now you could quote to them, you know, Abu Nawaz, uh, who had his own practices and so on and so forth, but Abu Nawaz had great insights into literature and, and, and into the human, uh, human understanding or, or uh, Abu Alal Ma'ari that some people might think Ma'ari was, you know, semi-agnostic uh, or maybe a believer of a different kind and so on and so forth. But, you know, these will be difficult conversations with madrasa communities uh, to, as I found, um, because, you know, they believe that, um, that, that those knowledge traditions really do not uh, uh, the, the contemporary modern knowledge tradition, because they are the product of the West, they, because they're the product of people outside the Islamic tradition, um, they need to be vetted. So, for instance, one good example um, that I always give is, is, is someone like Taqi Usmani and so on, a leading scholar, Mufti uh, in Pakistan, uh, someone who writes extensively, argues, for instance, that yes, modern knowledge is, is necessary, but what you need is you need some very, very good traditional scholars who need to study modern knowledge. Then they need to filter that knowledge to give um, that knowledge to the students because there are many, many contaminating aspects in modern knowledge. And the big issue that they are concerned about is the question of doubt. Okay. Uh, that, and people like Nietzsche and others who would sow, sow doubt into the minds of the young and completely demolish demolish faith and so on. So that's a concern. And, 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 and my, my pushback and the retort to that is that, you know, knowledge is messy. Um, but you can't take knowledge, you cannot take knowledge to a laundromat to have it washed and get the, the you know, you can't wash it. What you need is to grapple with, uh, with both the epistemological uh, questions and also ontologies. Knowledge is connected to the ontological about being and being is about existence. And existence is something that you no longer not share with others. In the even in the empire where you had majorities and minorities of Muslim empire, um, yes, you could shape the, the self according to the worldview and vision of the majority. But now you're living in a world that the believers and non-believers, agnostics, uh, Jews, Muslims, and Christians are sharing similar understandings of the world, the physical universe, and similar kind of understanding of, of, of the political. And so we are now living in shared spaces and we're living in shared, um, uh, you know, ontological as well as epistemological spaces. We might have very, very different purposes and outcomes, uh, for some, it will be salvation in this world and in another. For some, it will only about human flourishing in this world. But nevertheless, we have common purposes. So how does one deal with these issues? These were questions that I don't think that I've managed to make any headway um, with, with, the, with, the, with the Madrasa uh, community leadership. What I have since done, and I'm going to pivot to the Madrasa Discourses Project, is that on my visits to South Asia, uh, while researching the Madasa book, I then met with the Islamic Fiqh Academy Secretary General, a man by the name of Amin Usmani. And Amin Usmani is a very soft-spoken man. Um, he very uh, tragically died recently as a result of COVID um, and um, a big loss for me uh, as a supporter. A man who, who understood what this was all about. He understood what the burden was. And he kept on telling me, you know, in Urdu, 
you know, this is a lot of work. I told him, yes, I need you to be around to, to help me uh, navigate that. So he, he basically told me, look, people like you who study in the subcontinent, what about the possibility of you, you know, training and, and entering into conversation with the next generation of younger ulama in South Asia? And uh, I was at Duke at the time. And, you know, as you know, how universities are uh, in North America, in the religious studies departments, theology is not, you know, not the cool topic to have a conversation because it's seen as confessional. And, uh, but when I moved to Notre Dame in 2014, where, you know, you can talk about theology openly, you can talk about religion openly, they wanted me here to talk, you know, start a program in the study of Islam. I then, you know, approached the Templeton Foundation and they were open to the idea that, you know, how do I start a series of conversations with recently graduated madrasa students. And so we have now uh, been very uh, you know, successful in putting through about 150 of these young graduates, um, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, both men and women. And I'm very proud to say we have now over time and through experience managed to get people from different kind of, you know, uh, theological orientations. Uh, they are Diobandis, Salafis, Barelvis, Shia, Imamis, a whole range of them and so on. And, and while we are not very successful in getting women who, are, who had studied in the madrasa, maybe one or two, but some of the women who had studied at you know, International Islamic University or Jamia Millia, we have some kind of equipment because we want to make that, that possible that we also draw women into this conversation. So what do we do in the madrasa discourses? And one of your previous speakers, Sher Ali, I have roped him into, uh, into this project. Um, uh, is that, you know, um, I had previously the person who started this off was Mahan Mirza, but he's moved on to do some other things here. So what we basically do is the, the, the project title is, um, you know, um, revisiting or, uh, uh, you know, developing scientific and theological literacy. The scientific and uh, Templeton Foundation is a, is, is a foundation that is committed to religion and science so the, the scientific questions and so it's not that we're teaching people you know how to work in the laboratory it's more the kind of larger philosophical questions that the scientific worldview generates you know questions such as you know the human person questions such as uh, you know darwinian evolution questions such as you know history and time um the making of, of our world and we've roped in a whole number of different kind of faculty uh, right now um, someone is teaching them about astrophysics and so on so it's a basically a two-year program uh, that we put uh, uh, participants through through the questions of science through the questions of history and revisiting the text that they had studied in the madrasas by asking different kinds of questions to it is what we call the elicitive approach. Approach communities, these kind of communities, the communities that I belong to, from the questions that we know, from where we come from, from where I come from, and make that the platform of asking the questions that now can go a little bit more, but developing a certain kind of confidence that this is not subversive, but rather developmental. It's, you see, one of the biggest kind of fears that madrasa communities have, and that outsiders, like myself, I myself an insider, outsider, possibly more on the outside now, they think of us as subversive. Universities are subversive. The world, the, the, the governments in various countries are subversive. They're trying to pull them away from their tradition. So they're very much holding on to that tradition with their teeth. But you have some brave individuals like the ones that we've recruited in India and Pakistan uh, with the help of my really, really great and extraordinary colleagues, uh, Dr. Varis Mazari, who's a Madrasa graduate from Dioban, and who is uh, teaching at uh, uh, Jamia Hamdar and uh, Molna Ammar Khan Nasir, who is a, uh, you know, a scholar who taught at Nusrat al for many years, uh, also taught at uh, Gift University and now has Ibn Khaldun Institute. And, you know, his father is a, is a leading Diobandi scholar. Um, and um, so he's a, he's a, both of these colleagues are extraordinary instructors and uh, very well, well grounded in the tradition, but also they know their community. So basically they are partners in, in this. Uh, I'm just facilitating that. I do teach from time to time. And what we do is we take them for two weeks over the summer to a place like uh, Kathmandu, where we bring a whole range of, of, of faculty uh, to them, to them to study. We, we uh, build bridges and, in a, and for a week in the winter, which is around about December, 
we go to a, with the the, uh, the College of Islamic Studies in Qatar has been extremely generous uh, where they host us for one week. We just have to get ourselves there. Obviously, COVID has upset all that. But throughout the year, for about 13, 14 weeks, in two semesters, there's a two and a half hour, three hour online seminar. It's a very, very serious seminar that takes place with about a group of 45 participants at, at every occasion. And it's been just been extraordinary to see the kind of questions, the way we've been challenged, I've been challenged to think about a whole range of questions, um, uh, you know, in, in, in um, the, the issues of theology, the questions of uh, Islamic law, but also the questions about, you know, human existence and the questions of the philosophical, you know, how, how, how do we approach um, the world and what are the elements that go into that i do believe and i want to say it very modestly that we basically just scratch the surface there's a lot of learning that goes on here um we are also producing a volume of of, of essays with our partners and some of my some of my former students about how do we think about the question of the theological uh, and that is something that will come out so um and and so so maybe this would be a good set of of preliminary comments um, that will hopefully have uh, allowed you. Uh, so, so um, let me just say the following: in terms of contestations, this question of knowledge is also the kind of root question in one way that generates what other speakers have already talked about: the contestation between in the post, you know, post forty seven uh, uh, period between Diobandi and Barelvi and Salafi, right? Um, now, obviously, there are deeper theological questions. Um, you know, the the Deobandis uh, and 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 the Barelvis are were in in the kind of post independence period at each other's uh, throats. Uh, that has substantially been reduced, I believe. Uh, at least that's my observation. Uh, they still do, you know, generate polemics against each other. But they go back to certain kind of understandings of the of the the, the nature of the prophet. Uh, is the prophet, you know, um, uh, a person in an ordinary sense or in, a, in an extraordinary sense that the prophet is made out of out of light, and that's the Barelvi position um, that the prophet knows, you know, uh, the ghayb, uh, the unknown, and he's fully aware of that. And you know, the the other uh, issue is also, you know, the and that the prophet's presence is everywhere. So that is the, the Barelvi claim that the Prophet is made of Noor, made of light. Uh, the Prophet is Hazin Nazir, the Prophet is uh, presence of the Prophet. And the question of al Maghrib, that the Prophet has knowledge of the unseen. Uh, and, and the Diobandis, you know, would admit to some of those issues, but at a less at a less in with a less in, in a less intense way, and there will be varieties among the Diobandis and so on and so forth. Uh, it reaches a, a a conflictual point over the question of, for instance, the celebration of the Prophet's birthday and the way the Prophet is salute, whether you stand or you don't stand, and um, and then there's a contestation between you know you love we love the Prophet more than you do, um, you don't love the Prophet, you are actually anti-Prophet, and that creates a conflict that has substantially subsided. But these debates go back, you know, into the tradition. And I don't think the two sides have found any relevant con deep conversation about how do you understand those issues today, except that they have, you know, put their swords into the scabbard, so to speak, right? Uh, and God knows when they're going to take that sword out again, um, says my skeptical self. Um, and normally these uh, uh, questions come out when there are kind of political contestations in South Asia, in Pakistan, it happens with the whole question of blasphemy issues. And, you know, then the Barelvis take the lead and they push very hard on the question of, you know, the, the full ontological uh, absolute authority of the prophet uh, that cannot be uh, in any way impugned by any kind of way. And therefore it is the duty of the state and the Muslim community to defend the prophet's integrity at every level, no matter the cost, right? And the Diobandis cannot walk away from that unless they want to lose out big time. And, and neither can the Salafis and neither can the Shia and everybody has to love the prophet, but they love it in a different, they will have their own internal articulations. Um, and, and, and similarly, you know, the, the Barelvi Diobandi on the one side versus the Salafi is basically 
that the Salafis view when they find the, it very problematic that the these two uh, Barelvis and Diobandis they follow the Hanafi school with complete loyalty and don't raise any questions about sources and how the possibilities are that their early founders could have got the sources wrong. So the Diobandis and Barelvis accuse the Salafis of being غير مقلد that they are uh, they have uh, abandoned uh, following traditional authority. The Salafis, on the other hand, find the doctrines of both the Diobandis and the Barelvis to be extremely problematic from their point of view. The idea that both of these uh, schools uh, take an element of Wahdatul Wujud very, very seriously or in different doses of uh, the unity of, unity, unity of existence. Um, and, and the way they understand these questions, their doctrines of Tawheed, uh, the, the, uh, the Salafis would sometimes basically say that their doctrines come close to the question of polytheism and shirk. And they have deep problems with the Diobandis and Barelvis internalizing certain um, practices of Tasawwuf, which involves, uh, you know, uh, what they call uh, Tasawwur um, Sheikh um, and, you know, um, bringing your... Uh, uh, your sheikh, your, your spiritual master into it, uh, the whole question of your relationship to it with a past uh, a spiritual teacher, uh, those kinds of issues that they find that it's too enchanted to their, to their liking and that rather the safety is in the, in the um, quasi-literal tradition. Not, I don't think the Salafis are absolutely literal, but they have a kind of a quasi uh, literalist approach and some of the better ones among the Salafis do have uh, are forced to uh, make certain hermeneutical moves in order to co accommodate space-time context and so on and so forth. So um, uh, what I'm saying is that these debates are continuous and part of the problem they remain unresolved or maybe these audiences don't want it resolved but the people who feel the brunt of these issues are Muslims on the ground are Muslims on the ground and practitioners on the ground who are drawn into either as cannon fodder for protests where dozens are killed uh, in, 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 in blasphemy issues and when passions run high, confrontations with the police, whether it's Salman Rushdie or more recent uh, events uh, in, in different parts of, of, of South Asia, or whether it's about, you know, Muslim women, uh, you know, looking for uh, certain kind of solutions to a variety of practices in India. It is Muslim personal law, the triple talaq in Pakistan. Uh, it's also this, these kind of similar things uh, that are there in Bangladesh, also uh, similar kinds of questions. But it's also about, you know, life, everyday struggles for dignity. Um, and and, and the, the struggle for dignity to eke out an existence where they hearing, you know, a cacophony of voices that are pulling them in different directions. And in India, in particular, the question of Muslim development is the number one question. I mean, Muslims are falling behind in all kinds of statistics um, uh, and, and, and are falling behind even what they call the sh scheduled classes. Now, is religion the cause? Not necessarily, but, uh, you know, um, your your temperament, your attitude towards coexistence. Are you going to go into a school that is uh, with people with different kinds of religious traditions, or are you going to you know find yourselves in Islamic schools and Islamic universities and that kind of that kind of mindset? For someone who came from South Africa, where I think Muslims, as a very very small minority, have done quite well. Um, I'm obviously of the opinion that one has to find a modus vivendi to exist and that modus vivendi cannot just be purely political but it must also reach into your subjectivity how are you going to live with the other and it just cannot come from a pragmatic position but it must come from a deep understanding of the humanity of the other and yes the the other sometimes can be extremely barbaric uh, towards you but you have a duty and an obligation and so what is authenticity all about I'm slowly coming to the idea that it's possibly responsibility. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, extraordinary journey that you took us through, uh, both of your lives through history as well as through 
philosophical and ideological intellectual currents uh, of our times. Um, I had a number of questions. Uh, first of all, you know, um, I, I too grew up in uh, not one, uh, but minimally two, if not more, apartheid societies. Uh, one was uh, Pakistan. Uh, the other one was uh, Saudi Arabia, where I lived for a few years, which uh, Robert Vitalis has shown uh, is, in fact, an apartheid society deliberately created as an apartheid society. Uh, and then I, of course, uh, lived in the United States for 17 uh, years, uh, which is uh, uh, not obviously no longer formal, formally apartheid. None of the societies that I'm speaking of would be legally or formally in some, Saudi Arabia probably more so than otherwise. So there's uh, different uh, scales or degrees of apartheid as well and forms of apartheid. Um, the reason I start with this uh, is because I think a lot of what you have spoken about, it needs to be stated, uh, is in fact a direct result of the historically unprecedented apartheid character of the colonial state. And therefore of this post-colonial, after all, you know, that famous minute uh, on education uh, by Macaulay, yeah, uh, the formulation is quite extraordinary and historically unprecedented. He says we want to create a class of people yeah, who are Indian in uh, blood and color, um, but uh, English in tastes and opinions, etc. Uh, even that thought would not have been possible uh, in the past as if uh, you know, these things could be uh, uh, national. They belong to tastes and opinions were national or civilizational. Uh, these were new ideas and peculiar to that apartheid. And they created also deliberately, as the Macaulay Minute shows, deliberately created uh, an apartheid uh, society that wasn't just limited to the apartheid between uh, settler and native, as Mahmoud Mamdani uh, calls it, but uh, within the, uh, within the quote-unquote uh, natives also, uh, because, of course, apartheid is a, apartheid all the way down. The, uh, uh, the uh, and the other remarkable feature of this apartheid of the colonial uh, state was that even knowledge was uh, organized in an apartheid fashion. So uh, there, there were in fact national or civilizational knowledges that were hierarchical. Yeah, th this is all quite new and peculiar uh, to the colonial condition because neither. Uh, uh, I mean, for, for one thing, the colonial state was a national state. Uh, the empires of the past were not national empires, they were dynastic empires. So you had this new national apartheid uh, and also epistemological apartheid. So, uh, and we continue uh, in this society, uh, Dr. Iqbal Ahmed used to say, you know, Pakistan is an apartheid. Uh, we have linguistic apartheid in uh, Pakistan. Uh, I think it goes well beyond that. Uh, that apartheid character literally means that, you know, people of our class, uh, uh, you, Sajjad, now, uh, my, myself also, uh, barely are barely aware of this entire, these entire worlds of knowledge which have been completely ghettoized uh, in, I mean, since colonial times, but continuing into the present, uh, have been completely ghettoized. Uh, I mean, they have some popular political manifestations and somehow they've been incorporated into, uh, you know, state structures like the Federal Sharia Court, for instance, in Pakistan. Uh, but nevertheless, this uh, apartheid character of both, which is linguistic, which is uh, epistemological, which is uh, social in all kinds of ways. Yeah. Um, so a lot of what the madrasas uh, the, the situation that they find themselves in, yeah, uh, and the particular kind of conflicts, uh, contestations, and also the anxieties uh, that lead to the kind of withdrawal uh, that you've been talking about um, arise from that. Uh, that. So that's one of the questions that I had uh, for the presentation that you made. 
should I should I uh, should I uh, uh, should I wait for the uh, Sajjad or <clears throat> should I just go <clears throat> and then maybe I take Sajjad's question afterwards uh, no go ahead and then okay, go. so yes you know in in the book I do talk about you know madrasas as heterotopias you know the old the kind of that the the that breaks away from the nation state utopia and from the dominant utopia to create uh, you know a separate kind of uh, a space to pre preservation. Now, obviously, the crisis in the 19th century, when the new incarnation of the kind of late 19th century madrasas were, we don't have very good histories of, you know, madrasas during various Mughal periods and earlier. We have snapshots and so on, but we don't have decent histories. Um, <clears throat> um, so, but at least from the 19th century onward, the Dioban model will bring all, you know, have a place prior to that obviously was Farangi Mahal um, in Lucknow which was a kind of a dynastic family uh, uh, outfit and they did great work and produced great extraordinary scholars and so on and so forth <clears throat> but um, you know the the one and in so you know if you look at the Farangi Mahal school the Farangi Mahal school kind of you know taught generations of people some of their major scenes or science, you know, went to um, different parts of India. I'm thinking here, particularly of Bahrul Ulum, um, Abdul Ali um, Bahrul Ulum, uh, who ends up in Chennai, what is today Chennai, in Madras. He's buried there. Um, you know, I, I, I like this guy. I, I write a great story about him, of how he's a kind of an itinerant figure who ends up, goes to Madras with about two, 300 students in tow. And, you know, uh, prior to that, he was in different parts of, 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 of West India and North India. Um, but, you know, it seems that they were fairly still living under the kind of aura that, you know, there's, there's this empire and there's this, and this imperial epistemology that they had, that they thought that the Mughals are still around by, you know, as you know, by, by 1810, the British had taken Delhi, right? I mean, it's, it's game over, so to speak. And, um, but Muslims in India were still living. Some of them were thinking, how do we deal with this new new contingency, uh, Shawaliullah's grand, uh, grandson and his collaborator, uh, Shai, uh, uh, Sayyid Ahmad uh, Raibareli and uh, Say, uh, Sh uh, Shai Ismail, uh, they decided jihad is the way to fight the British. Before they got to fight the British, they had, they, they met their Moses with uh, Ranjit Singh and, you know, and they then, um, you know, found themselves kind of beaten by the superior uh, forces of, of a regional ruler. Those embers stayed until the Indian um, uh, you know, uprising uh, against colonial rule, uh, 1857, some of that. And then again, you know, so it's in that space that people like Nanotu and others believe that there's a question of preservation. And if you've ever been to Dioban uh, and some of his madras, these early madrasas, they have very thick walls, about perimeter walls. And, and it was a kind of a, a, a kind of men, you know, a mindset is about protection of what is ours and avoiding contamination, except that both Nanotvi and Rashid Ahmad Gangoi are grad, uh, did study with their teacher Maulana Mamlukul Ali at Delhi College in the vernacular. You know, they took some classes with him in vernacular classes in vernacular language. Delhi College also had, had English. And I think that's where they took the bureaucratic organization of how to, you know, the kind of British model, Barbara Metcalf talks about that and so on. But so the question that confronts that constituency, uh, you know, the, the ulama constituency, largely Sunni constituency, varieties of Sunni, but also I think it applies to Shia and smaller groups like the Dawoodi Barelis, uh, Dawoodi Boras and the Ismailis <clears throat> on the subcontinent. And that is, you know, how do we, how do we now, do we keep the same position? Now, there are some madrasas in India, at least in Maharashtra, um, by a man called Vastanvi, uh, where they have tried to develop, you know, um, high school, madrasa, you can also go to college and so on. But it's all very much kind of siloed. And the intramural converse, mural conversation that takes place because exactly as you said about the anxiety of the 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 post-colony and the colonial and the question of the past and and uh whether it is you know dominant hegemonic narratives that are uh, still colonial 
and maybe they will be more open to a kind of a decolonial narrative uh, if it is put to them and how to deal with that. But whether it's colonial or decolonial, whatever, you will have to learn, you will have to acquire the literacy. You see, who, who can do decolonial? Are people who went to modern universities. They do the decolonial because they know what the colonial is. You can't tell a madrasa uh, 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 a student, you know, decolonial. They will say, "D what?" Um, you know, because you you need to uh, you you need to tell them, you know, what is the what is the harm in Mill or the way that Rousseau saw things. Uh, what is the question of the nation state? I mean, most of the places when you look at fatwas that come out of madrasas across the board, even in the Arab world, the fatwas look at the modern nation state and its apparatuses in very mechanical ways. It looks at even bioethics in extremely mechanical ways. Okay, you're talking about gene therapy, you're talking about organ transplant, how does it work? Let me give you an answer, boom, right? It's not the full question of, you know, organ transplantation, by, you know, um, gene therapy. These things have consequences, social, economic, uh, on the long term. How I, I, There's no rationale behind that. It is kind of, now, unfortunately, these audiences are also put on the spot. They need to have a quick fix. So they do the fatwas in the best way that they can. They don't even remember Ibn Nujayim saying, the great e Egyptian scholar, uh, Ibn Nujayim saying that, you know, you don't only have to have fiqh uh, of a fiqh fatwa but you need to have fiqh fiqh You know, you, you, in other words, you need to have, you need to understand the big picture of your fiqh judgments and your ethical and juridical rulings. You need to see the unforeseen consequences of that. He says the same thing about fiqh al qawa You can't, you mustn't just be competent in being a judge, but you need to understand the kind of the big picture, the imponderables, which you need to think about. And some people have that kind of qualification and ability to think. And you can't think those, through those things today unless you have some handle on whatever you think of how these things might do. Future studies is a whole, a whole area that uh, people have, have pondered and thought about and so on and so forth. So the question here is that yes, we are labored and burdened with these various inheritances, but we are also, we also, and I think this is something we don't often talk about, that our heritage also has been extremely divisive. I mean, you know, in 18th, 19th century, uh, 19th century until early 20th century, people used to read Mullah Sadra, right? Who was a clearly, uh, you know, Shawaliullah read Mullah Sadra. He keeps on talking about uh, Shirazi, you know, um, uh, Kala Sadra Shirazi. Nowadays, people don't read that. There are boundaries that have gone up now, okay? Um, 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 you know, you know, people like Ibn Salah and others, you know, frown on Ghazali and said, you know, how could Ghazali take you know, the Greek uh, heritage seriously and how can they take logic seriously and said, you know, you know, God forbid, uh, you know, people like um, uh, many other scholars said, you know, Ghazali has lost it uh, uh, in, in a variety of ways and so on. Th that is also part of our tradition. So might not be big scale apartheid, but kind of small scale uh, apartheid too. And we need to be open uh, to that kind of inquiry and, and uh, awareness and not be, you know, and you see a part of the kind of decolonial, post-colonial thing is we don't want to open up our own heritage to critical scrutiny because we say the other is going to grab it and then uh, criticize us on it. So what? So what? So what? So what? We are a civilization that, you know, can put all our goods out for inspection and we now at a position that we will say, well, we'll have to make some choices. Uh, these are the things that we like, and these are the things that, you know, we're going to uh, say a prayer over it and, and put it to bed, you know, and, and give it a good resting place. Um, so I think this question that you raise is, is uh, this anxiety. We cannot continuously live in a state of anxiety. And how do we deal with our anxieties and how do we empower ourselves? So the, the condition, the modern condition does impose a certain kind of what we call agonism, right? You're agonistic, you're neither here nor there. This, this, this pulling on your body and your soul. And that is a difficult situation to go through, but we won't, Muslims will not be the only people that have gone through this uh, in, in human history. And, and, and I think, I think we, we are now at, at, at the stage that we can have these conversations and we can, and it's not about, you know, you know, 
wiping off and saying, no, we're going to be anti-tradition. No, it's about how do you think about, well, how do you put together the, the puzzle of tradition uh, for time today? In fact, Walter Minolo would say, don't use the word tradition. Uh, tradition is what modernity has made all other knowledge uh, systems. So talk about the Muslim knowledge system, right? Uh, because of, uh, um, you know, Talal Asad and, 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 and uh, uh, what's the name, McIntyre, we now talk about tradition. And, we, and Talal Asad is very fair. He says modernity is also tradition. These are all knowledge traditions. So let's call it knowledge systems. You know, Africans are struggling with the knowledge systems, uh, the indigenous knowledge traditions. The Chinese are doing that. Uh, you know, everybody, Latin America is a very, very, you know, earnest debate about, you know, how do we deal with knowledge traditions on the ground that as part of our lived experiences. Muslims are lucky compared to others that we have a memory of our knowledge systems. In Latin America, I mean, you have to go and do ABC, uh, you know, ethnography to figure out how, uh, you, you know, the, the Quechua and, 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 the, and the indigenous people are living to get an idea because they didn't have a, a, a written tradition. And these traditions have been disrupted. The native Indian tradition on, on this continent where I am right now uh, are disrupted. I mean, the, you do have Native American universities and so on, but they're trying to put these things together. They're trying to put their past together. So Muslims are kind of comparative advantage, um, you know, given that we've had a, a, a lived tradition and this, this tradition is still living in Muslim bodies, but obviously in, in a very much in an in a, in a agonistic sense, and uh, with some, I'm, I'm hopeful that the, and this is what gives me really hope is this, this project and this project of, of the Madrasa Discourses where I see these young people uh, teaching me and making me understand all the possibilities uh, of how this tradition uh, can be applied to their lives and how they can bring about uh, possibilities of human flourishing. Sorry, I took a little bit too long in this morning that um, Sajad. No, in fact, that, that's very useful. I mean, uh, um... Again, I have I have lots of questions and lots of kind of I, words which jump out. Um, I mean, I guess uh, the most obvious one, you know, going back to this idea of uh, the the madrasa as a fortress um, of ideas um, that you mentioned earlier, you know, the foundation of the and stuff. That obviously arises out of a, a sense of um, of attack, right? So defense against some sort of attack, uh, which of course is precisely the the point that we're making about. Uh, colonial modernity. But I want to maybe come back to this point that you mentioned about authenticity, right? So um, I understand this idea of um, authenticity being about grounding the self, right? Understanding who the self is, understanding the, the inheritances perhaps of the self in different ways, um, but also the way in which that self very much works not just at a local level, but as part of a wider world, right? So it's not about kind of just rooting that self in a particular tradition, but also understanding that, you know, especially nowadays, those traditions cannot be siloed. It's absolutely impossible. Um, we live in a world in which you have so many different kinds of um, influences. And I guess even Madrasa students must have social media, uh, right? Um, so, because everyone has a smartphone, um, it's as simple as that. So you can't really kind of cut yourself off from these wider things. So um, that really then does raise the question of what does it mean to be authentic, um, you know, within such a context? Uh, what sort of formation of the self is involved? And and it certainly seems to me that while I take the point about the, the Madrasa tradition being atomistic, of course it is, and it's pretty much in every context, um, although some are changing more than others. Um, and this is without kind of resorting to nostalgia, but certainly one of the ideas of the Madrasa system, which was important, was this idea of the formation of the self, formation of the ethical self in particular. And, uh, you know, kind of almost ironically, one of the um, interesting um, comparisons to that idea is precisely decolonial praxis, right? You know, really thinking about what is educational about. And another good example is, is Wail Halak's project, right? So Wail Halak's project has all become about how do we reintroduce ethics into education? Because it seems to have been completely um, devoid of that, or certainly ethics and the formation of the ethical self have been taken out of that. So 
I guess I just want to push you a bit more on, on thinking about this question of authenticity and the question of, you know, really what is the function of this, um, this institution, this formation, this education as we're moving forward in the, in the space of the post-colony, which you mentioned right at the beginning. Yeah, no, thank you. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question that we all agonize about. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I don't think I have any, any answers to your very, very, uh, you know, uh, clear and, and, and uh, uh, appropriate questions. Um, but I, I think that what you are hinting at and what I seem to have understood that that Muslim societies in the past and the present are heirs to multiple knowledge traditions or knowledge spaces or knowledge systems. And um, part of their success in the past was to build on existing ones. They did not reinvent the wheel. The problem is that some of these things that we have had you know, some some major kind of projects global worldwide was, you know, to reinvent the wheel, whereas actually we have to re the question must be to reinvent knowledge, not the wheel, right? And 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 how do we have you know deep conversations about knowledge? Um so I think when one has now the, the question remains the dilemma that knowledge is not free floating either. Knowledge is anchored in material and historical conditions. And knowledge itself then is built into it, is a design of a way of living, a way of existence. And we are caught in an epoch, uh, and I take the Anthropocene very, very, very seriously. I'm just reading a very important book by Jürgen Ren, The Evolution of Knowledge. Uh, from the beginning to the to the Anthropocene, your R E double -N, N. It's a very very fine grained work. I'm trying to think about these kind of questions about you know um, various ways of epistemo epistemo epistemological modes of thinking. He takes seriously um, these questions about you know marginalized communities' experiences uh, and how we deal uh, with those uh, with the experiences of marginalized communities. And I think that, you know, um, Muslims too have this opportunity uh, to do this. But you see, I don't think it's, it, it's going to be extremely successful if it is done in, in the ICU ward, uh, intensive care unit. You must be able to, you know, breathe and get oxygen from the wider world. Sometimes, you know, sometimes you, when the patient is very sick, you go to the ICU, um, but otherwise you need to develop herd immunity to use a contemporary, a contemporary, uh, what's the name? And you need to be able to develop the capacity to live and, and breathe the air that everybody else breathes. And so this wider world that you talked about. So I think what we, what, what, what I think part of the, the, the challenge of the Muslim self is the empowerment of the Muslim self. What we need are we need small success stories. We need small success stories. We want one institute that is an institution of excellence. I'm now thinking very practically. I've seen I've seen in my life people talking about you know mega projects and then and it all falls flat once the person dies. I want small success stories. I I mean I always tell people, you talk about Pakistan being a basket case. Look at the Edi Foundation. Okay, look at that. One person makes a contribution and builds something, right? It's 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 a wonderful example, uh, you know, of 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 a of a social institution of an NGO that does amazing work. All over South Asia, all over the Muslim world, you're going to find <clears throat> some people who are doing really really meaningful work, from pastoralists to people who are agriculturalists caring for the self and so on and so forth. So the picture, unfortunately, the media gives us about the Muslim world is people gone crazy who only know about blasphemy and, um, and, and they behead, uh, you know, teachers' heads who show them pictures uh, or it's terrorism. And part of this thing is also the leadership of various Muslim countries like these kinds of headlines because then they can tell their partners in other parts of the world, we are the only guy standing between you and these barbarians, okay? So 
send, keep on sending the money to us, okay? We keep these, these people under control. Various kinds of dictatorships in different parts of the world who make all kinds of deals above the heads of their peoples and the hearts of the peoples and over them. And they would, they would fly in, in, if they get them two minutes, they will all be off the stage if, if their people can, can get to them. But I'm not here encouraging people uh, to do irresponsible things. I'm just describing <clears throat> a, a, a historical condition. So what we need is micro levels of empowerment and success stories and human development. <clears throat> you see, in the madrasa, <clears throat> where ethical formation needs to take place, I'm talking from experience, because of the lack of, of, of elementary level of wealth for existence, the absence of that causes a huge way that the self has to act in irresponsible ways. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to put it in, in a more subtle way. Um, in other words, you know, while the Muslim middle classes and, and, and others are lavishly spending wealth in different, different places, the madrasas basically run the entire school year annual budget and providing kids food and what's the name, what would be a week's budget in any small college in India and Pakistan, secular college and so on, right? Uh, so they are very much kind of Spartan shoestring operations and so on. Now, obviously it's also become a big business I'm working at your madrasa. I see that you are you used to drive a cycle, and then now you're on a motorcycle, now you're driving a car. And so I also do that. I go to the other corner and also open up another madrasa because I can now do fundraising because of that. So all kinds of you know ethical perversity also uh, comes into that into that. Not not everywhere, but there is that, that happens, and we need to be aware of that. What we need to do is that those of us who care about those institutions need to come with a helping hand. And a helping hand is to provide resources, to provide, a, you know, um, 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 uh, expertise and to work with them uh, and, 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 and let them achieve those objectives that they want. And also in the process, make them share with them knowledge traditions that they are unfamiliar with in a way that will empower them. And so the, the self is uh, the self is not only spiritual, but is also shaped by materiality. And the material conditions of many parts of uh, the, the world that we are talking about doesn't make it easy to live uh, a, a life of, of dignity and, 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 and flourishing. That dignity is, I mean, and the reason why we have different parts of the world, including the United States, I mean, this big resurgence in Europe and North America, you see, of, 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 uh, of white uh, power and white right-wing activity is a deficit of dignity. The, the nation state has overlooked these people. These are the flyover people of America, right? These are these uh, white folks who the tech revolution and everything else has overlooked them. You know, they, um, they impoverish, they live from hand to mouth and they see immigrants like me who come and, you know, in for want of a better word, we have kind of made it. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. And so they, there's a resentment and so on. So you imagine in places like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, <clears throat> with this large, you know, you know, sectors that are impoverished. And for those impoverished sectors, the madrasa is the place that gives them the elementary knowledge, right? Not all of them can go to school and then they, they get into that bubble and for lifelong stay in that bubble and that bubble has its own problems. Uh, the deficit of dignity is there too. And the deficit of dignity are also at your secular universities and colleges where everybody is either looking for a job uh, in, in, in the government that will be paid and not sure whether the ethical ways of getting that job doesn't really matter uh, and, or go to the Gulf or go to outside to get, get something. That's the search. Why, there must be the possibility why that our people can get dignity in the countries which they are. You must hold the political... Uh, you know, uh, uh, authorities hold them responsible, put their feet to the fire. And you just cannot just play around this game. This is a dangerous game that many governments are playing, you know, you know, telling madrasa communities, you know, we are with you, we're going to certify you and so on and so forth. You have to go beyond certification. You need to provide them with resources. Uh, you have to take money away from the military uh, budgets that you're spending uh, trillions of dollars on and give ordinary people the wherewithal to make a life of, life of dignity. At the end of it, it's all about human dignity. 
why are why are we i mean those of us who have had better opportunities and so on why are we having kind of lives of let's take it for a minimum flourishing because we are entered into conditions and so on where these things are possible it's 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 not always possible in the spaces that we are talking about and also not very possible for many people in europe and in north america to make it out of it i mean west virginia is uh, or parts of in, uh, indiana and so on are also in in deep spaces of indignity so this is a global phenomenon i just don't want to harp on on the muslim world but since we're talking about the traditions and and then and the knowledge practices of those societies uh, that's what, so if you want to talk praxis um so therefore i'm now yes i can't change the state i can't go and talk to imran khan and tell him do x y and z he might say who are you to talk to me uh in the first place uh, but i can talk to people who want to listen to me at the madrasa and let's build a community a small micro community where we can give those teachers lives of dignity we can give the students a life of dignity small micro stories 100 that that will build that will and there are some places like that experiments in different parts of south asia that this is happening and i think uh, many of the people i speak to and i speak to them all the time realize that this is this is possible so your answer to the self the self is not only about the resources of the past but is also about the material conditions of the present otherwise that self is going to suffocate now yes i think uh, norman is going to remind me but that you know you have to have the way in the way we use the world's resources must also be ethical and that's what we all are into so consumption capital uh, we have to rethink what is the way out of capitalism can there be other modes of existence that we don't deplete the earth these are the bigger questions but but you know i'm dealing with a small sector and i know these mega meta questions are all above me but i can't deal with the meta questions at the same time but i try Uh, so, so that uh, can I take the next one or yes, you have... yes, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, you know, I didn't mean to suggest that uh, the uh, the madrasas are not responsible, uh, but I, I mean, now you've uh, just addressed it yourself. The fact that uh, you know the, they are actually ghettoized. Yeah, they simply do not uh, have the resources. That's one of the things that being in a ghetto means. Uh, but it's also a kind of cultural ghetto. I mean, the thing is that people of, uh, you know, uh, English speaking classes, they're simply not uh, interested at all uh, in this. I mean, not unlike my colleague, they think, uh, you know, one shelf of a European library uh, is uh, worth all of the knowledges of the past in Sanskrit, Arabic. I think that holds largely true for uh, the, you know, the linguistic apartheid uh, the top community that uh, uh, Dr. Iqbal Ahmed talked about. Um, and I also wanted to ask you a question about uh, uh, philosophy. Yeah, uh, the place of philosophy. I, I mean, I think you, you, I mean we live in a very non-philosophical age, and I think you know talk, when Tocqueville went into uh, went uh, uh, to America in the early 19th century and wrote Democracy in America. He mentioned this. He said the Americans are the most non-philosophical uh, people uh, in the history of the world. Yeah, we don't exactly live in a terribly philosophically given age, and where philosophy even does exist, uh, as Sajad will remind us, uh, it's not philosophy as a way of life as it uh, used to be. Yeah, so uh, philosophers in the modern academy are dramatically different uh, from uh, philosophers as they might have existed in the past. So in the madrasa itself, um, by the way, the question that I want to ask you, so it, it seems to me, so I'm a personally a convert to Shiaism uh, myself, and uh, the difference between the uh, madrasa and the hausa, yeah, uh, in terms of also the translation of all of these continental uh, philosophers, for instance, um, you know, the Foucault, you mentioned Foucault earlier, uh, he's been translated, yeah, uh, in, uh, in Persian. Um, uh, Sajad can enlighten us more about how much of that intellectual discourse is part of uh, uh, the Hausa, uh, how, how, how much are uh, figures like that read in the Hausa itself, but in the general culture. So that's a very, very dramatic difference if you look at uh, Pakistan. Uh, for instance, between Iran and Pakistan, yeah, 
this is what I'm thinking of in terms of the translation uh, into the regional languages. Um, you see a really, really particularly impoverished um, uh, situation in terms of knowledge uh, in not just the madrasa, but in the larger uh, in the larger vernacular tradition that uh, is quite different from uh, Iran, for example. Yes, no, th thank you. <clears throat> no, so um, I think one of the things that, you know, um, Muslim societies are so stratified in different places, let's talk about subcontinent, very stratified. And, and we have to come to terms with diversity, that there are, you know, going to be this diversity. But how do we make, how do we celebrate diversity, just not tolerate diversity? Right. That is the number one question. Right. And do not, you know, discriminate against people because they are diverse. Um, so you're sitting with a checklist, you know, this cabinet minister, you're going to play the kind of, you know, games of, you know, representation and so on and so forth that are deeply divided. You, you have to and, and maybe you, we, we need to work about that. <clears throat> so I think that, you know, um, the philosophy is, is really impoverished in, in the Sunni madrasas of South Asia. Um, and I know a good bit about Iran. Um, yes, there's a there's there's a lot going on there in terms of entire libraries and so on and so forth. But you know that also <clears throat> is only limited to a certain sector of uh, the Iranian clerical uh, you know uh, uh, groups and and the, and the ulama is, is is not deeply you know um, uh, di deeply um, extended. Uh, but it is it is and and Sajad could correct me here. Um, but there are people who are thinking seriously about those issues. My question is, I wish I can, you know, I can get more of those kinds of conversations because I, you know, I, Abdul Karim Sarushi is a friend of mine, Mohsin Karivar is a friend of mine. I, you know, and every time, you know, they talk, they talk about, you know, but, you know, we have Akal, Akal, you know, the Iranians talk about Akal and so on. I said, yes, Akal, but okay, give me, give me a solution to the problem. Okay. And, and, and I find all of us are in the same boat. We are all struggling to get with these very, very deep questions. But yes, there is a, a good literacy. And obviously, Iranians uh, have, have taken to you know, Heidegger a, a great deal because Heidegger has some kind of overlap with being and becoming and Mullah Sadra and so on and so forth. So some of that conversation is there. Um, I'm, you know, I, I, you're right that we are living in a very a philosophical uh, age. And, you know, many people just completely wants to isolate us. I mean, what is the regular kind of narrative you get of ordinary Muslims uh, or even the learned, you know, go back to the Quran and Sunnah. Everybody thinks all the answers are already made. No one wants to think. This is also the rhetoric that comes out of the leadership. And, and in the past, you know, in the, 500 years ago, when you had a question, you go to a learned person who will, will help you think through a question and so on. Now you want to type it in and say, what does the Quran say? What does the Sunnah say? And you want to have a quick Google answer. You want to go to share Google. Now, I, I, I appreciate literature. I, sorry, I appreciate literacy and everybody, uh, the literacy is good, but we, we have not provided young Muslims, whether inside the madrasa, outside the madrasa, with the ways of how to navigate complex literacies. So simplex literacies work. What we have is an affliction of simply simplex literacies, we, it's actually would actually be an insult to literacy to call it literacy, but it is the mindset because the number one issue that the Muslim self today is concerned about is about identity. It is not about subjectivity. It's not about the formation of the self, but it's about identity. This kind of more external kind of combat. Those those issues that I was battling and the demons I battled with when I entered the subcontinent or as a juvenile uh, uh, and ill-equipped to deal with those issues, you think those are. But the deeper questions about the soul, about being, about friendship, about love, about wisdom, those kinds of questions are the philosophical questions. And so I'm, you know, and, and part of the things we, and, and here people like Sajjad and others might want to help us, you know, in this decolonial mood, how do we make, you know, philosophy accessible uh, to Muslims? You know, how do we, talk about, you know, philosophy in everyday terms, you know. Um, I mean, you know, why must, you know, okay, so we, we, we throw uh, people with Johar and Arv, you know, substance and, 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 and um, what do you call it? Um, um, uh, Accident. Uh, uh, sorry? 
accident. Access, uh, subject and accident, or we talk about mahia, uh, you know, um, uh, essence and matter, hayula, and so on and so forth. We need to write books um, uh, uh, about these issues in in ways that these come through. And you know, uh, and what is the? How do we think about mahia, uh, mahia, uh, you know, uh, essence and existence and wujud and those kind of questions? We throw these big words around. But we can talk about in very, I mean, someone like Marilyn Robinson, for instance, is extremely successful in talking about full, s complex philosophical questions in ways and modalities that ordinary people can understand, right? So, but you, I'm sure someone is going to remind me, but first you need to make Muslims to be reading communities. Yes, so we need to be reading communities, or there are other modalities of reading, but we need to make these things interesting. We cannot dumb it down. I mean, this the idea of dumbing it down is, is deeply problematic. So, you know, Emerson and Thoreau are great, are, are great philosophers. Maybe Tocqueville, you know, miss them. Um, and, and, and the question, uh, but these are kind of everyday ev way of philosophy in everyday life. These questions about thinking, for instance, what is understanding? What is fiqh? Fiqh nafs. These are deeply philosophical questions. Understanding of the self. Um, and so how do we break this down, whether it's from the mosque and the mimbar, uh, or whether it's in the school, high school classroom, or at, at the madrasa level and so on. Because I, I, I can assure you that this group of very smart madrasa students we have, they are kind of, you know, flawed by, now how does someone like Sher Ali, you know, write such a very complicated history about a discussion that we've heard over and over about, uh, uh, you know, the Munazra Shah Jampur, right? You know, this Mabahiz Shah Jampur. We've heard this over and over, and he writes a whole book on it, right? So it is it, because he breaks it down. He's gone through a certain kind of uh, of training um, where these kinds of questions are. Okay, what does this mean? What is the value of that? How do you write your history? Um, only some very, very good people like Manazir Asan Gilani, for instance, uh, who, has, who, wrote, who wrote the two volume history of Deoband and so on. He's one of those people that could make the turn to the other side by staying a lot more in the, in the kind of orthodox or traditional camp, but he could speak out and bring that tradition with great light. I'm sure there are people in Iran and so on and so forth that, that, that are doing that too. I think I'm thinking of, you know, Mushtaj Shabistari, I think about Mohsin Kadivar. Um, um, Kadivar is a good friend of mine and so on. Uh, so so, so we, we, these kind of conversations are vital. I mean, in our part of the world, a lot of the philosophy was communicated through poetry. Uh, yes. You know, and it goes on and on. All these philosophical terms, actually, uh, Mahiya and uh, yeah. other yeah. philosophical istalahat terminology is uh, replete yes. in that yes. uh, in that particular kind. And, and 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 we need and we need to. Uh, in fact, I'm I'm making myself a pivot to to literature. Um, you know. Uh, people like Mantur, Ghalib, and so on, because I find greater inspiration there. I, I mean, writing theology and, you know, you know, um, the relationship of God and to attributes and, you know, what is the nature of God, the way God, the way God speaks to me today? I mean, <clears throat> you know, um, the nature of the, of the universe, the new cosmology in front of us, what is the nature of being a continuously expanding cosmos? Um, that is the reality. I'm, if Ibn Sina was here and I kept on reading his books, he would slap me and said, you know, are you stupid? Um, you know, I mean, uh, he would, of course, he said you need to read my books, but you also need to read the stuff, you know, uh, what's going on right now. So I, I think that, that that is very, very critical that, that we deal with the Because what is philosophy? Philosophy is a question. And these are questions about intensities, as Deleuze would put it, you know, intensities that you... Uh, concepts are intensities. It's it's an aggregation of ideas and thoughts that you and but concepts are also not stable and static. They work for some time and then you have to replenish them and refurnish them and remake them. Um, and unfortunately, in the institutions that I I was taught in the madrasas, there's very much the holding on, and you you will all say the need is anxiety, and therefore they did. But they always want to hold on to what is permanent. So the first question I get is, you know. So are we going to rethink Islam? What about the permanent stuff? What about the thawabit? And I said the thawabit stays on this place. Think around the thawabit. Then you might also see the thawabit slightly differently. And I asked, asked okay, you talk about thawabit. What are the permanent elements? So someone give me an element of, you know, okay, no ishtihad with, with the nas, 
Okay, the Quran, what's that? But just but the understanding of the Quran must it be the same way that Suyuti understood it? And there's no ishtihad on a text. I mean, that is a a slogan. Ishtihad meaning you know innovative thinking and thinking through ab initio about a text of the Quran or the or hadith of the Prophet or the statement of the Imam, um, how to interpret that and so on. There's not just one way of interpreting that. And, and But some people are saying, no, you can't do it. When you have a nas sarih, a clear uh, a statement, you can't do ishtihad. The very idea they're using the Arabic language and you're thinking that itself is a kind of ishtihad. But these are slogans to stop, uh, you know, transformation and change. So yes, the, there's an obsession with permanence uh, and stuff. But, and I think when we psychoanalyze those communities, it will be about the dangers they see from outside, the threats, and therefore they want to hold on to that. But everybody, we must have being and becoming. There must be not only wujud, but sayruratul wujud, right? And, you know, the transformation of being. So that's where I would go. And, and I, 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 but that's a question of, that's a question of, of confidence. It's a lack of confidence of dealing with both of our tradition and what's the name. Um, you'd be surprised that the, uh, the, the, some of the people we've had in our program, uh, many of them, as good as they are in the languages and so on, they don't fully understand the tradition either. It's that slice of the tradition that was put in front of them that they know well. And then the rest of it comes as surprise questions. And then it requires a kind of remaking of, first of all, confidence, anxiety, and so on and so forth, and then going forward. Sorry, long question, a long answer. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's, there's many things to, to follow up, but I'm just also aware of the time. Um, I, I guess one very small uh, kind of point I'd make is that um, Certainly, the, the way philosophy was studied in, say, the Safed Madrasas or in even in the Darsin Nizami mm -hmm. was very much this notion of a conceptual framework. And, and sometimes it was also, um, it was for pleasure as well. So, you know, if you, you cannot read, for example, the very many logic texts which are written in India without thinking that people just enjoy doing it. Right, so so that that pleasure element of it is clearly something which is gone um, through out of a lot of things, um, and and also I think the other point that you mentioned, which and, and Norman mentioned, which is extremely important, is the aesthetic. So um, you know there was a reason why in the formation of the ethical person people read Saadi. Mm -hmm. um, you know it's it's a, it's a work of literature, um, or when uh, people were reading. Um, works in Arabic uh, grammar and so forth, they were always reading that alongside what were considered to be the best examples of Arabic literature. So um, it, it's kind of bringing in the literature and the, the philosophy, uh, which is there. And also, you know, the conceptual framework is, is just a conceptual framework. Uh, you don't have to, if someone asks you a question, you don't have to talk about the wujud and the mahiyya and, and properties and so forth. You, you basically translate that into, into terms um uh, which which are understandable and of course one way that that's this has happened in iran in, in the 20th century was through kalam jadid so kalam jadid was extremely influential and successful um because what it it was a particular kind of instrumentalization it was to say okay we've got this philosophical tradition which seems rather esoteric but how do we instrumentalize that to deal with the big questions so that's precisely what Tabat Tabai was doing. That was precisely what Mutahri was doing. And some of the positions they then came up with strike a lot of people as being extremely radical. You know, so for example, Tabat Tabai says there's a massive distinction between metaphysical issues, right? And everything else is conceptual. And if it's conceptual, then it's a way in which we make the world which we can change. So pretty much the whole scope of the legal precepts that people live by, he would argue is conceptual, right? Now, again, to many people that's shocking. <laughs> that means that you can pretty much change most of the ahkam on, on things because there's nothing fixed about them. They're not metaphysical realities. They're moral questions and moral questions are conceptual, right? And there's, there's many other kinds of examples about that, but the, the material constraints are important. You know, I'll give you one example of how that material constraint works 
with respect to both the kind of secular modernity and the tradition. A number of years ago, I, I visited Lucknow, which was extremely disappointing at many levels. <laughs> but one of the things I did was I visited Sultan al Madaris, you know, which is the first major Shi madrasa in Lucknow, um, was founded by people who were clearly very bright. First thing that strikes you as soon as you go in is this grand old building, but it looks like it's going to fall down any second, right? The, the walls are crumbling, they haven't been painted, the, the floors need work. Um, you've got a small bunch of students who look very impoverished. They're, they're from villages in Bihar and, and UP and certainly other parts of, of India. Um, they're just surviving. They're just surviving. I asked them um, about their manuscripts and they were very reluctant to say anything, but they finally found their, their Fejeres, their catalogue, and they gave it to me and this, this catalogue was falling apart. So I dread to think what the manuscripts are looking like. And then, of course, they were very proud of the fact that they had also embraced modern learning. So they took me to their computer room, right? And you go into the computer room, and this was in 2009. Um, there were about five extremely ancient PCs, which were covered in dust and didn't look like they'd actually been used uh, for quite a while. Um, so there's a sense in which, you know, the survival mode becomes more important. And this is precisely why, you know, one of the interesting things, again, coming back to Halak, you know, Halak makes a lot about the, the waqf, the importance of the waqf as an institution and how people need to go back to this. This place is not going to survive and it's not going to flourish unless it has an endowment. It's just not possible, you know, because they cannot fix the building. They cannot, they cannot uh, do more than just literally feed their students. They cannot bring in good um, students. They cannot bring in good teachers without that basic um, uh, foundation. And then what it also then means is that madrasa, which is in the bang in the center of Lucknow, doesn't seem to be at all connected with the wider community in Lucknow. You know, apart from the fact that maybe one or two teachers are, might be people who also preach from the pulpit. So, um, the material conditions are extremely important and, and there's no there's some, there's no getting away from the fact that a place like Iran is is a lot wealthier than a place like Pakistan or India is. Um, you know, they of course they have the similar kind of differentials, but the basic um, living conditions are very di different uh, of a seminary student in one place as opposed to the other. Um, so yeah, the, I, I mean that's kind of an anecdote, but I think the main the main thing I would mention is Yes, this how philosophy actually works as a lived experience, and then how it links to this notion of the aesthetic. Well, yeah, no, you totally. I, I, I um, two things. I also be. I, I also went to the Sultan Lumadaris, and it's basically half a dormitory, and 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 the situation was very very painful to see. And part of that is also because Islam and Muslims have become part of a political football. In India, because Sultan Madaris is 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 is, um, is uh, on a stipend and a government thing from from either the UP government, I think UP government, maybe not central government, and so they even if they want to put together a um, you know a walk or endowment or something of that sort, there will be all kinds of interference and all kinds of red tape and so on. Same thing happens with Dairatul Maarif in Hyderabad. Dairatul Maarif have not been able to put together. I mean, they used to be um, do amazing printing and so on. The thing has board appointed people, there's some, you know, government uh, subsidies, but that place needs to be, you know, needs new tools, new tech, uh, uh, new printing press, they need researchers to do the work. And in fact, if they're not going to train the next generation that th those skills of editing and those kinds of things are going to disappear and it's just going to become another, another white elephant. So you're absolutely right. And you see conceptual frameworks and aesthetics uh, material 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 conditions enable uh, and disable um and you know maybe one of the things that where some of the work that you are doing and so on would be to possibly think about you know what is what does the post mutahari post tabat tabai you know kalam jadid look like you know and what are the kind of common what are the conversations that could be had i was very keen to take my program one summer into iran but um uh, it's just 
becomes, I mean, it's easier for the Indian and Pakistan students to go, but, you know, as an American institution, the grant is here, there are all kinds of uh, yeah, challenges too, but there's poss it's possible to bring, say, for instance, someone someone like Mushtaj Shabistari or somebody, um, or people that you know, other people, to a, a venue in Pakistan and India, that'd be much more easier to have that conversation. So we need to have that conversation and, and maybe you need to come too. So, um, <clears throat> so there you got well, the and you got the that there are there are Indian and Pakistani students, um, and there are some who are actually quite good in okay. Khalza, in, in Qom. So uh, okay. they can certainly engage with that as well. Uh, so you should so you should bring them. Yeah, sure. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Well, there are lots of questions I have on my mind, but uh, you know we've gone well over time. Because it was such a stimulating conversation, uh, so I think uh, we'll thank now Professor uh, Ibrahim Musa. Thank you so very much uh, for joining us for this uh, scintillating sec uh, episode of Islam after colonialism, Sajjad. Yeah, I was. Uh, thank you from from me as well, Ibrahim, and I certainly look forward to actually meeting in person. Maybe we can do this at, as our end of year conference or something like that. Um, just to very quickly mention our last talk this term will be two weeks from now when we will be joined by um, uh, Leila Uddin from King's College London uh, and she will be talking about Red Islam in uh, South Asia. Um, so we'll be pivoting to something which a lot of people have forgotten about which is the relationship between the left and wow. communism and Islam which um, has important resonances um, within the colonial and of course in the post-colonial. Well, let me just thank the, uh, the both of you and your institutions for, for inviting me and I really enjoyed this conversation. This has been really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see everyone next time. Okay. 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 Okay.